Okay, guys, I'm back from the break, and we can resume the hand analysis and the quiz. So we are moving on to the flop play quiz, and yeah, again, uh, a big thank you to both Raven Queen and Dr. Coffer for submitting uh, your hands. Um, it's always nice to have material to work with and for me to show you guys so everyone can learn from this. Um, especially Raven Queen, of course, and also all the other guys, and I can use uh, them to show you guys some important concepts um, that I use in my own uh, grinding sessions or that I use in my own game, uh, stuff like that. So it's it's very a very good thing to learn from. And if you want to submit hands in the future, um, I can only advise you to send me an email. I'm going to give you the address right now. Um, this is my email address, and you can always submit entire sessions, selected hand histories, six max cash game only, mind you, no tournament hands or stuff like that. All the tournament hands or the other um, hands go to uh, the other trainers. I'm only doing the six max cash game hands. So, yeah, just submit hands to that email address if you want your own hands to be analyzed in one of those database doctor classes. Um, I do have a kind of a long wait list right now. Um, so I have to be finishing up on uh, another. I I don't I don't know. I think it's about three or four hand history hand history review classes uh, that I'm going to be doing with different PSO members. But if you want to uh, put up your hands for review, you're always welcome to do it. And it's going to take some time, so be patient about it. But it will I will get there eventually, and I will review all your hands. So I will promise whatever you sent me, I'm going to review it. It's only a matter of time. <laughs> Okay, so flop quiz. We're looking at hands from Dr. Coffer now. So yeah, Raven Queen is out of the, the hot seat. <laughs> she can breathe again. Okay, so ace-jack offsuit on the button here. Um, it's going to be a flop quiz, so we have to look at the flop action. Because uh, preflop is pretty much straightforward. There's a guy that loves limping, and he does what he does best. He just limps into the pot, and so Dr. Koffer isolates him on the button. Um, small blind calls, and the limper calls. You can't see? Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to... Sorry. Just a few seconds. Here you go. Yeah, should take away the slide first. Okay, so guy who loves limping, limps into the pot. Dr. Koffer isolates him. And uh, a guy that loves flops and a guy that loves limping, they both call. So what I want to indicate with those names is they're probably weaker players. So it's fairly certain that those guys are weaker players. Um... And a flop comes 10, 9, 4, 2 clubs. And it's getting checked to us. Uh, okay, guys, so now it's on you. Would you fire out a C-bet here, or would you just check it back? What would, what would your line be in that spot? Let's see. So we have no C-bet, check, C-bet, check back, bet 20, check, two players, C-bet, C-bet. So we have a lot of people who are advocating C-betting, and a lot who are taking the free card and checking behind. Draw heavy. Okay, so my, my general approach in spots like these is what I'm looking for on a board texture when I want to decide if I'm going to c-bet it is number of opponents at first, it's going to be two opponents, uh, type of opponents, which is probably loose passive, and board structure. And the board texture, the board structure is such that it doesn't allow for my hand to improve too much. And it also allows for so many different hands for my opponents to connect with this board texture. And I'm not going to get rid of my opponents here with just one bet. So what I would generally figure here is I've got two opponents, which is an argument against betting. I've got two overcards and a backdoor flush draw, which should be actually an argument for betting. But... Um, my opponents are also very call happy. They like they lo they love limping, and the 10-9x flop is always a flop texture that connects with so many different hands that I just don't see that 
sea betting against two loose passive players in that spot is going to show a big long-term profit. I think we should just take the free card, see if we improve to a backdoor straight, to a backdoor straight, to a backdoor straight, fl- a straight draw, to a backdoor flush draw, to one of our overcards. Um, I don't think it's going to be a very good board to be planning to fire multiple barrels on against people who just love seeing flops who uh, will stick around with all sorts of draws, who will improve with all the outs that we might find to be our outs, like let's say we turn a jack or we turn a club. Um, that might get get us into more trouble than checking behind actually does. So I really think that um, this should be a check behind. Um, somebody just said, I just saw in the chat, yeah, that's... Um, Lots of turned cards to continue initiative. Being that they are passive, I want to build a pot. You are ab- you are absolutely right in saying that it's a good idea to be looking at spots where you can maintain the initiative, where you can t- where you can uh, plan on barreling mul- on multiple streets, which is nice, and you can pick up some decent cards. But only think about the cards that do improve your equity to a backdoor straight draw, a backdoor flush draw. Those cards will also improve many of your opponents. And you can't really utilize uh, fold equity too much in that spot. Like, say any club comes up and the, the opponent still has, like, a straight draw, a flush draw, uh, a 10, a 9 in his hand. He probably has, like, uh, a 7, 8, a 9, 7, 9, 8, uh, jack 10, queen 10. All those, all those cards that might look to improve your equity, they're actually making things worse because your opponents are probably improving too. So you always have to be looking at two sides of this. The one is, okay, I'm going to look for spots where I can fire multiple barrels, where I can pick up more equity, which is a good argument for betting. But the argument against it is most of those turn cards will also improve your opponent, and they won't be folding too much. So uh, that's what you really have to decide between, and I really think that the argument here goes in favor of just checking back and taking a free card. So um, I think checking back is fine. Absolutely. I wouldn't fire a C-bet here. And I don't think it's it's a great spot to be C-betting. Um, and now comes something that you shouldn't try at home. Something that Dr. Crawford just um, had in mind. He just tried to push somebody off the hand here on the turn. I would never do that. It's probably a bad idea, and it's probably going to backfire, I guess. And this is exactly what what happens, the guy just calls with a 10, and he's in there limping and calling a race with 10-7 from out of position, not letting go of his 10, so, yeah, you can't really uh, force those guys out. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's a good spot to be C-betting, but um, good points from you guys. Uh, Let's move on. This is spot number two from Dr. Koffer. Yeah, there's one thing. One thing is bluffing. No bluffing without equity. You can bluff with equity. I mean, we had equity. We had two overcards. We had a backdoor flush draw. We had a backdoor straight draw. That is a lot of equity. But the real problem is we're really not getting anything to fold, either on the flop or on the turn. And even we're not getting a lot to fold when we improve to those hands that give us more to those cards that that give us more equity. And that's the that's the whole problem about this. <clears throat> right, okay, so this is Ace King on the button, and we have a limper from Limping is Fun, and Loves Limping makes a min race. This is like all this funny stuff that those guys make. It just looks so funny to me. <laughs> limp, min race, limp, min race. <laughs> they just love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, and Dr. Coffer did what probably is a good idea trying to isolate one of those guys I actually think it's uh, on the smaller side I would be three betting to a bigger amount here would be three betting to 14 or 16 yes absolutely agree um, I'd definitely raise more because what will happen most of the time is limping is fun just uh, thinks that well 10 cents is not a big enough amount for me to be folding here because limping is fun so I'm just gonna see a flop um, yeah, I think 16 is much better is a much better size here, and both pretty much call. And now this is a flop, queen queen 10 rainbow. Both players check, and it's getting checked to us. What would you guys think now in this spot? Is this a good spot to be c betting? Bad spot to be c betting? Maybe similar to the last hand. 
Check back, check back, check back. Seabed, seabed. <laughs> so as always, we have all different opinions on this. And to be honest, I think it's a little similar to the last spot, but it's, it's also a little different. In a sense that on this board, this is a paired board. So a paired board always makes it harder for your opponents to actually have hit this board texture. Like when the flop comes 10-9-4, there are three different options for your opponent to have made a pair. And the 10-9-4 also allows for a lot of straight draw combinations, like gut shots, open enders. With the queen-queen-10 board, the texture is a little less coordinated because we only have a one gapper, a one gapper in between. And also, um, the board is paired, so it's much harder for opponents to actually have hit that flop. And I think that in this particular situation, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really hate a c-bet. I don't think a c-bet is maybe. I don't, I'm not sure if, if c-betting is the best. It's the best play, but I also cannot really find too many arguments against it. I mean, this board texture is a little different from the one that we saw in the last hand. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So always be thinking about board textures, numbers of opponents, and your equity in the hand. In this spot, if you're betting, and this is this is another argument, if you're betting on this flop and your opponent is calling you with an inferior pair, you actually have more outs. Like let's say your opponent has pocket nines or pocket fives, and they decide to just call on the flop with their two pair. You can really counterfeit them on the turn by spiking a 10. So a 10 is, a, is an additional out for you. And that is something that's also very important on paired boards. Um, if it was queen, queen, deuce, I think queen, queen, deuce is a little different from that because queen, queen, deuce is a better board texture because it's not connected at all. So you won't get called by gut shots or straight draws too often and you don't really know where you're at on the turn when you get called. And there's not really much for your opponent to actually have on queen, queen, deuce. So I actually like queen, queen, deuce a little better for a C bet. But queen, queen, 10 is fine too. And as I said, I think um, I think it's it's a better it's a slightly better board texture to be betting at to be making a c bet than the, the the hand that we had previously. But Dr. Crawford checks back, which is fine too. And uh, I think checking is is absolutely fine against those guys because they just love to limp. And um, yeah, there you go. They're not folding anything. Um, so yeah, it's it's absolutely it's arguable. Um, Every every option is arguable. You can check back. You can see that in this spot. I think. Right. That was the quiz number two on the flop play. Let's move on. We only have about half an hour, a little more than half an hour left. So I really have to get going on all the hands. I'm sorry, guys. Um, if you have any more questions and I didn't address them, uh, just let me know. I'll try and do it as soon as possible. <clears throat> So ace queen in the small blind and preflop he makes it four big blinds. We have a guy that's short on money. He only buys in for or he only has a stack of 50 cents left. Um, actually, I think given the stack size of this guy, the raise size from doctor from the dock isn't too bad here in that spot. I would actually think that it's fine to be making it four cents. Usually you should make it a bit, little bit bigger. But given the stack size, I think it's actually nice. You want to entice him to call here in that spot. And the guy does call, indeed. And we flop top pair, top kicker. Actually, we flop top two pair. Okay, so here's the flop question for you guys. Would you bet this? And if yes, how much would you bet? Okay, so majority of people said bet, and they would be betting amounts between 10 cents and 18 cents. Half pot, third of the pot. And I see one player checking, and that's interesting. Um, I see only one of you guys is checking this flop, and um, I actually like that idea. I really like that play. Um, and there's a there's a particular reason for this in this particular situation, and it's the stack size of the opponent. Because this guy is on such a short stack, 
we are going to be able to get the money in on two streets. If we bet one street and he calls, we can get the money in on the rest, on the, on the remaining street, on the other street. Like if we bet flop, we can get the money in on the turn. If we bet the turn, we can get the money in on the river. And if we check in this situation, we can actually have him take a stab at the pot. Um, yes, that's right. We don't want to give him free cards. That's right. But actually, on this particular board texture, we don't want to generally give free cards to opponents too much. But on this particular board texture, I don't think it hurts too much to give a free card because there is no real hand that we're going to be afraid of, except for an 8 or for a flush maybe. Um, but in most cases, he won't have connected with that paired board. I said in the previous hand that on paired board textures, it's harder for your opponent to connect with the texture because of the statistics and the combinatorics. Um, it's, it's very hard for your opponent to have anything on this flop. So what we could do is, what could be a good idea is checking and letting him take a stab at the pot because he might be betting all his crap. If he has like 4 or 5 suited, or if he has like ace 3, or if he has, I don't know, king jack, and he didn't connect at all, we might just give him the opportunity, give him the rope to just do something terrible, do something bad, and we can benefit from that. And because of the short stack size, we don't have to be afraid that we can't really get the money in. We're not really missing out on value here. So, and... The other argument, since we're out of position, I think that most people, when they do flop a flush draw, or when they do flop a straight draw, or when they do flop anything, like a draw or a gut shot, like let's say he has 10-9 or jack-10, they will be betting that for sure most of the time. Believe me, guys. I've seen so many people, they just want to take down pots. When you, when you, when you signal weakness in any situation, they will just uh, try and take that pot away from you. So... Um, yeah, I really like checking here in that spot. I actually think checking is good. Um, Dr. Koffer bet 11 cents. If I were to bet, I think I would even bet a little less than that. I would probably bet around half pot or even... I liked also the idea of betting just a, a third of the pot. I think betting a third of the pot is better. Thinking about bet sizing is very crucial here because you really want your opponent to be calling. Um, and even though you're giving him good and, and good immediate odds and you're maybe even giving him a free card... Um, it's good to just entice him to do something uh, really terrible and to just spaz out and do some some stuff that you that you profit from. So he calls and on the turn, the ace of clubs comes and Dr. Koffer bets and this guy folds. And this is really where I see the problem in the hand. I think that in most of the cases you will actually force this guy out with that betting sequence. If you're taking that line of betting, betting on the flop on queen 8-8, eight, eight, and then betting that ace on the turn, this will probably really scare this guy away. And I really see some good arguments for either checking flop or really checking turn. Try and give him some rope and let him just take a stab at the pot. Yeah, I really like checking either flop, or once we bet the flop, I would like checking turn and give him some rope. It's a good idea against those short stacks, because... You just have to imagine, what, what, what do those guys think when they're in a hand? They're involved in a hand with their short stack, and they don't really have room for any big maneuvers. So what will they do? They will just say, well, if I get the chance, I'm just going to move in, because, well, maybe he folds. If he doesn't, hmm, bad luck. But I just have to do something, because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm on such a short stack. It's the same as within tournaments. If you're playing a tournament, somebody who's playing a short stack, they will get their money in, at the next best chance they got with like any ace, any pair, any gut shot, any flush draw, whatever they flop, they will just go with it. And this is the same in cash games. If you give those short stack guys some rope to do something bad, they will do it. They will just get their money in, right? That's what they love to do with their short stacks. And that's the only option they have. <laughs> right, okay. That was the hand number three, I think. If he checked back on the flop, what should we do on the turn? Um, I think we could argue for another check, but I actually think that once he checks back the flop, I would bet the turn. Um, because once he checks back the flop, it's pretty obvious that he has some sort of either some sort of short on value or he hasn't he hasn't got anything at all. And I wouldn't imagine him to be starting to bluff when he doesn't take the opportunity on the flop. And I would bet small on the on the turn then, because we do want to get money in, yes. Because either he probably has short on value or he has nothing at all and he doesn't really start bluffing. Because if he wanted to start bluffing, he would have probably done it on the flop already, I think. Yeah, it, it might be kind of scary if you bet the turn, but you can't really let it happen that it gets checked 
completely down until the river. So uh, if he checks the flop, I'm pretty more I'm pretty much more confident that he either is giving up on the pot immediately or that he might improve with that turn sometimes and give me action with like a one card flush draw stuff like that. What if you were making a min bet on the flop? You could do that too. I mean, betting really small. Somebody suggested betting a third of the pot or even a quarter of the pot. I think that's a nice line too. Uh, just do anything to entice a short stack to do something um, that you can profit from. Okay, so this is a hand where I'm not quite um, comfortable with the preflop decision that the dog made in this hand. Yeah, you're, you guys are absolutely right. But this isn't the preflop quiz. It's going to be the flop quiz. So, yeah, it should be a fold preflop. But the dog did decide to raise it up here and make a little re-steal. Um, I don't like that for so many reasons. First is the guy is a weak and aggro, ag aggro player. And he only has a medium stack. He only has uh, 50 big blinds. And against that stack size, it's probably very tricky to be 3-betting hand like ace-4 offsuit because you're going to be in a lot of situations where you're going to be dominated yourself. Um, you might get him to fold some better, so, but I don't like it too much. Uh, weak aggro guy calls, and we flop a pair and an overcard and a backdoor flush draw. So would you guys um, c-bet this flop, or would you just uh, give up on it? It's not even suited. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> C-bet now. Check. Check. Two checks, one C-bet. Four checks, five checks. Three C-bets. C-bet. Check. Check call. Bluff catch. <laughs> so many different ideas, guys. It's always so intriguing um, to see what different opinions people have on different situations in poker. Um, I mean, there's so many of you checking this flop, so many of you see betting, and yeah, the answer to this is probably you can't really tell what's better, because you 3-bet in a hand, you, you're, you're in a 3-bet pot where you shouldn't be in, you 3-bet a hand that's really too weak to be 3-bet actually, uh, given the stack sizes, and now you're in a troublesome spot, because if you bet, you could be committed. If you bet any shoves on a flush draw, if you bet any shoves on overcards, um, you might be making a bad laydown if you fold, you might be making a bad call if you call, so it's really tough. You shouldn't be in that situation in the first place. But given that the board texture is so dry and that you actually flop the piece, it makes it less likely for your opponent to have actually flopped anything good here. And I would just take down the pot in this situation as long as I could, as long as it's hot, and you can just take it down um, with a C-bet. And I really think that C-betting is the way to go. But, and I have to say this again, um, this is something about bet sizing again. I don't like the size of this bet um, because it really puts too much money into the pot already. We bet 27 into 37, and this guy only has 92 cents behind. If he shoves, we're in an awkward situation where we actually want to make the call, but we know that we will be beat sometime. So it's really tough to get away from this hand if we bet that big. I would bet much smaller, bet something like 18 cents or maybe 20 the most. The maximum would be 20. I think 18 is fine. 18, like half pot, would, would be absolutely enough. Um, but I really think that C betting in this situation is a good thing to do uh, because you will be taking down that flop. Uh, on that flop, you will be taking down the pot pretty frequently because the opponent won't have anything. Um, even Well, if he does have a pair, he's going to continue anyway. So you're, you're not going to force out any pair if you bet big. Um, so you could just bet 18 cents and then get folds from all the hands that didn't connect at all and uh, lose less when you do get called. So this is the whole gist of this. And the guy folds. But C-betting here is is fine. It's absolutely decent. 3-betting is not, though. 3-betting <laughs> against that short of a stack is, is going to spell doom most of the time. Yeah. Bad preflop play, but good flop play. Well, not so optimal for play. It's a good line, but it's not a good bet sizing, probably. Okay, next hand. Can you guys see the King-10 offsuit in the small blind? Okay. 
So limp, limp guy, limps again. Uh, he's again, he is short on money. Uh, I should have labeled this guy short on money, but this is limp, 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 and flop, flop, flop. They want to see flops, so that's what they do for a living. <laughs> they see flops for a living. Okay, both guys call, and we are out of position against both of them. Are we going to see bet this texture, or are we not? Check, 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 check. No bet. Anybody betting here? Everyone giving up against those guys? Yes, me too. Me too. Absolutely. I mean, you can make an argument for betting here against one player. If only one player would have called, I think this is a decent board texture to be c-betting because we do have some equity. We have two overs. And it's such a low... It's a coordinated low board texture. On those low board textures, we have some fold equity against those medium hands, even ones that are better than mine. Like King Queen is probably going to fold against the big bet. Uh, Jack 10 is going to fold. Queen 10 is going to fold. Some some worse hands, some better hands are folding, so we can take down the pot a decent amount of the time. Uh, some Ace X combinations are folding. Like Ace 9 is probably folding. Ace 8 is probably folding, um, and we can fold out some better. Uh, and we still have some equity with two overs. So against one player, I think this is a good spot to be c-betting. But against two, I wouldn't. And especially not against those two short stack guys, because they are going to be shipping in uh, so frequently with any pair, any draw, any ace high maybe, uh, that it's probably not worth uh, c-betting here. But we have some success. I mean... After all, it's a very dry board texture, even though it's coordinated, but most people... Most of the time, people don't have those very, very low suited connectors, so they, they don't really connect with that board texture too much. But that's the reason why I think that betting against one is fine, but betting against two from out of position is probably a little thin. So I wouldn't be doing that against two. All right. Um, I think that's about it with the... Um, with a flop quiz, let's move on to the turn quiz. Uh, this is interesting. This is another one by Dr. Koffer, and then we're going to get back to some hands from Raven Queen, because <laughs> uh, I still have some spots on the turn and on the river here. And this is 8-9 suited in the small blind. Uh, don't know if you can see it right now, but it will come up soon. Okay, so here we go. Um, two limpers, limpy dimpy, and another unknown player limps. So we complete the small blind with 8-9 suited. It's decent. Um, I wouldn't be raising with a suited connector here, given the stack size and given the bad position. So completing is probably fine. Uh, raising wouldn't be, I think because raising would just bloat the pot, and we are on a short stack ourselves, so it's really a bad spot to be in from out of position. Um, now we flop an open ender on a two-flush paired board texture. In a multi-way pot, I think this is probably a draw that's not worth chasing. I would be check-folding this board. Even though we flop an open ender, I would still be check-folding this board, because the real trouble is we have three opponents. One of them can easily have a 10 one of them can easily have a flush draw, and we're going to be in a lot of trouble if the turn or the river is the jack of diamonds, the six of diamonds. Um, if somebody makes a full house with one of our outs, we're going to be in big trouble, and it's a limp pot, so it's probably not even worth uh, taking a stab here. I would pretty much be check-folding this flop most of the time, um, even though we have an open-ender. But we're out of position again, and um, this is a board texture where we, where we have huge reverse implied odds. And our implied odds are also hurt. Like, imagine we, we hit our open ender and we make it with the jack of diamonds or the six of diamonds and the other guy gets scared of the flush. We don't get any action anymore. So it's really a bad spot to be in, I think. Um, and this limpy dimpy guy calls. And the turn is a four of hearts. What would you guys do now? So once we've bet this flop and this guy has called us, how would you proceed on the turn? What would be your turn play right now? Now, given that we have made this uh, debatable flop play, of course. Check, check fold. Check call a small bet. Bet big. 
bet, give up, draw, check. As always, it's so exciting to see all those different opinions. It's 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 so. This is what I love about poker. Everybody has their different styles and different input, and you can really get some good discussions going about this. And I'm only giving my opinion too, so you can make of it whatever you like. But it's it's a good thing to 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 discuss poker in that way. It's just it's just just a great thing, and it just goes to show you that there are so many different views on spots and hands. Um, there's so much to to discuss about poker. I'd run it twice. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> all right, um, so I'll tell you what I would do. Since there are so many different opinions, I think all are decent. I think check folding is fine because, as I said, the flop play was pretty much debatable. Um, I think betting now actually is a little bit better. You can make the situation a little bit, a little bit better for us if you keep betting. Yeah, sorry, if you keep betting. Because, and here's why. Um, when the opponent calls the flop, I pretty much can narrow down his range to either a slow play 10, which is never folding, of course. He can have a flush draw, which might be folding. He might have a 7, which might be folding. Of course, I don't expect uh, a 7 to get folded that often. He might be having a small pocket pair, which might be folding to a bet. And in case he does have a 7 or a flush draw, we actually have some pair outs to fall back on. The 8 and the 9 might be clean outs for us. Like... If you have, if you river an 8 or a 9, you might be good at showdown. It might go check, check, and you win. You might actually still have the outs if he doesn't have a flush draw. You might sometimes even now have the implied outs if he has a 10, and you do hit your, uh, you do hit your straight. So I think right now, it's not too bad to put out a second barrel. It's not too bad of a spot to put out a second barrel. Because we have a lot of outs. We do, um, if we do get called. But... Again, this is one of those spots I wouldn't want to be in in the first place. I would just check fold the flop because this is so tricky to decide and it's going to be tough to decide on so many rivers what you're going to do. So, um, betting, I, I, can, I can definitely see arguments for betting on this turn, to be honest. And now it gets checked through and gets checked around so we don't take a stab anymore. And a guy wins with the king high flush draw. So as you see, this is a spot where... Would we have bet the turn? He might have folded sometimes with the king high flush draw. He might have called. And we might have improved to an 8 or a 9, and we might have been good. So why not just take another step once you, you start stabbing? But in the first place, I would just give up on the pot and just check fold on the flop. So that was that turn play with the 8-9. Let's have a look at the uh, next spot. Let me see. Oh yeah, this is going to be a, an interesting one. Um, if your line is bet the turn, you need to bluff the river unless you get showdown value. That's still a decent option. I wouldn't take it at the micro stakes levels because people will still call you down with a 7. They'll probably not fold a 7 on the river. But yeah, you can sometimes bluff a river. Like the Queen of Hearts, you could have bluffed that one uh, for sure. I don't think it's it's a bad thing. Um, in theory. In practice, at micro stakes levels, maybe not. At higher stakes, maybe yes. Okay, so that was another hand played by Raven Queen. And um, it's going to be a turn decision. And here's a spot where a tight guy tries to isolate a weaker player. So that's a, that's a guy that limps into the pot and he gets raised by this tight guy. And we have ace-jack suited in the small blind. <clears throat> And I have to admit, I'm a little bit torn here in this spot. Um, we want to have a look at the turn play here in that spot, but um, I think it's okay to make that call preflop, but I don't like it too much because we're going to be out of position and this tight guy is raising what's probably going to be a strong range of hands. Um, we, On the other hand, we actually want to call and see the flop with that limper, but we don't know for sure if he's going to call. And if he's not calling, we're not closing the action, we're only going to be heads up with a tight guy, so that's an argument for folding. So I would probably be folding uh, some of the time, only if I expect the, the limper to come along for the ride very, very often. I think uh, calling is, is okay, it's decent. And that's a very, very decent flop for our hand. It's, it's a great flop. 
Um, and now, in this spot, when we're out of position, when we're not closing the action, I think the best play you can take is actually leading out here. I really love leading out in that spot for one particular reason. We want to trap as much dead money as possible in this pot. Uh, when we lead out, we can get a call from worse by the weaker player who limped into the pot. And we maybe can even get the tight guy to race so we can get it in. And that should be the plan for the hand, I think. And I, that's why I really think leading out here is a good and decent option. And now the tight guy bets pot. And yeah, what are you going to do? Um, you have to decide. We have top pair top kicker with the nut flush draw so we have a highly equitable hand um, our biggest equity advantage is on the flop so I would just get it in here taking full equity on our side and just shove it yeah I think shoving is best here to be honest we have such a strong hand um, we could call maybe sometimes he's not folding an over pair of course but we are flipping against most of those except for pocket aces but um, yeah, that's that's the whole trouble about this, and this is where the trouble comes from calling preflop, uh, because if we check raise now, we lose the 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 loser, we lose the the limper guy who might be calling with weaker hands. But that's why I also like leading out much better, uh, except uh, besides check. I I don't like checking too much here in that spot, to be honest. That's the reason for this. Well, um, Raven Queen decided to check call, and the turn is a three doesn't really improve our equity and the type guy moves all in <laughs> and now we're facing a really tough spot so what do you guys do we have to call another 136 into a pot of 338 so we're getting pot odds of about 1 to 2.5 uh, so we'll probably need between 28 30 percent equity I guess do we have that? I actually didn't do the math on this. <laughs> but if somebody did, you can help us out. But I'm just going to fire up Poker Stove right there. And we're going to do it. But you can decide for yourselves. And then I'm going to give you the solution. It's very close. Um, we, we have, against an overpair, we actually have about 28.5% uh, equity. So it's very close, but I still think it's a call. Um, we can't really get, we can't really uh, allow to, to be folding that much equity right now, um, even though we will be behind most of the time. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I think shoving the flop would have been better. Um, yeah, and this spot, I think just calling it off because you still have so much equity going for your hand and you get decent pot odds to just call this off, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out, I think. Um, you will have... If you would be getting 1 to 2 odds, you needed 33% equity, you're getting better than that, so you're pretty close to that range. 28.6% is what you need, uh, what you have, and you should be getting that in immediate pot odds. So um, I think it's fine. I think it's fine. But as I said... Um, Leading out on the flop, which be the, would, would have been the much better play, um, and uh, check-raising the flop, where your equity is best. Even against pocket kings, you're coin-flipping on the flop. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. But you can't get out of it anymore. <laughs> um, let me have a look. Ah, I have another... So since since the, the session is coming to an end... Um, I want to fire up a quick river quiz hand that I found in um, Raven's database. So let's have a look at this spot, if you guys can see it. A7, yes. Okay, so we have a min raise from an unknown player, and we have A7 suited in the big blind. Um, Three betting here, it's it's an option of course, but against an unknown player, I think given that the pot odds are so great, we just have to put in one more big blind, and we're closing the action. I think calling is better. I don't like three betting. I, I it's it's okay to be re-stealing of course, 
But you're pretty much doing it blind. You're flying blind here because you don't know anything about this guy. You don't know what hands he's going to call with. Uh, yeah, because you min raise. I would be doing that in the small blind much more often than in the big blind because you're not getting that good of a price. But when you're in the big blind, you get a good price to just call and close the action. So I would probably do that more more often than 3-betting. But 3-betting is, is not a mistake by no means. It could be a mistake potentially. That's the problem. Um now, we flop the nut flush draw, which is always great, and you decide to c-bet, which is fine too, and the guy calls, and the turn is a jack, and now you decide to fire again, and I like that bet, um, even though it's a little small on the smaller side, I would make it a little bigger, and just try and um, increase the pressure on this guy, still a lot of stack size to be played out, uh, that jack might be a scare card, it's a great double barrel spot, yes, we have the nut flush draw, we still have outs, the jack is a scare card for the opponent, so a good spot to be betting again. Maybe betting like 40 cents would be better, I think. I think I would be betting 40 here. Love the double barrel, yeah, definitely. And we spike an ace on the river, so here's the river decision. What are we going to do on that river? What would you guys think? What's your play here? Shape. <laughs> Um, something to note, or on a side note, had we bet bigger on the turn, we would only have left, we we would only have a pot, about a pot size bet left on the river, and we could potentially shove in and maximize our value. And I absolutely agree. I think that betting here is best. I think checking is not so good. I mean, there is a flush draw out there that could have busted out. There is one straight draw, but since we have the nut flush draw, we are blocking two cards that form a potential flush draw hand. And for that reason, and because our opponent has only been calling twice now, it seems more likely that he actually has a hand with showdown value, and I would go ahead and bet a small amount, probably. I wouldn't bet too big to scare him away. I wouldn't, I wouldn't shove. Um, I would only shove if I had bet the turn bigger, but right now I'd probably bet around a little more than half pot. Um, yeah, it's, it's good to think about what worst hands does he call, but the other thing is if you're checking, you're still losing out on value. Even if he doesn't call, even if he doesn't call that often with a weaker hand on the river, it's still going to be more profitable to be betting, because if you check and he bets, chances are that he actually has the better hand. Like, if you check and he bets a big amount, are you willing to call? Can you actually call profitably? And that's the whole problem about it. So um, turn it around, uh, make it more easier for you, and just bet that river for value. Even though you won't get called that often, it's still better. And if, yeah, exactly, if we check, he's going to check back all the showdownable hands. And if he bets, we don't know what to make of this. That's the whole problem about this spot. So I would really uh, bet a small amount. Um, half pot is about right, like that size and the guy calls. If he jams, that's a good question. If he jams, I think it's an easy fold. I think we should definitely be folding. He probably has like two pair or slow plate set there almost always. Or like ace-jack, whatever. Why why, why on earth he can, can be having ace-jack here? I don't know, but he will have it. And if he shoves, there's no way he can have too many flush draws. We're blocking a straight draw. Um, we're blocking a straight draw, we're blocking a flush draw with a 7, we're blocking the straight draw with a 7, and we're blocking a flush draw with our two hearts. So I don't think there's a good chance for him to to actually have um, anything to bluff at with. And he actually had pocket 10s. He made that call with pocket 10s. Yeah, you'd probably just call Ace Jack, we don't know that, but... If he jams, I think it's an easy fold. Okay, guys, um, that's about the spots that I got, the most interesting ones, and I think we're um, about to wrap this session up. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, and thank you again very much to Raven Queen and Dr. Koffer for submitting and providing their hand histories. That was uh, awesome. Um, I always love it when you guys submit sessions, so I can work with that in my uh, trainings. Uh, and as always, if you want to have your hands reviewed in one of the upcoming classes, just send me an email with the uh, session attached, and I'm going to make uh, a class out of it. So, um, 
What were the leaks? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think there were some seabedding leaks in Dr. Coffer's game. That's why I put up all those spots with a seabed. Um, I didn't have too many hands on Dr. Coffer, so I can't really say too much about it being a leak or not, but I figure that it's probably... He should probably be working on his seabedding um, tendencies and frequencies. And um, with Raven Queen, actually with both, I think there are some, some bet sizing issues. I think you should definitely strongly consider bet sizing options more often in spots and really consider what bet size is optimal and why. So that's something to look out for. I couldn't really find too many obvious leaks, but it's pretty much preflop hand selection with Raven Queen and it's seabedding tendencies with Dr. Coffer. Those are two areas that I would really... Uh, put more work in in your guys' games. So yeah, that's about it to to sum it up. Um, yeah, that's it. And thanks again for submitting. Uh, hope to see more submissions in the future. And um, see you guys again next week on another class. I think I'm going to be playing live next week. I um, think there might be an, an, a video on bet sizing in the archives. Yeah, have a look at it. Uh, yeah, and Dave has a bet sizing video. Okay, that that was it. Yes. All right, guys. That's it for now. Um, see you guys next week. Uh, good luck at the tables. And uh, looking forward to more Database Doctor classes. Bye-bye.